Welcome. My name is Brian Havel. I'm director of the International Aviation Law Institute at DePaul University College of Law in Chicago. This is the third event in the Institute's special oral history series, Conversations with Aviation Leaders, in which we explore the origins, history, and record of US airline deregulation, joined by academics, officials, political figures, and industry leaders who played a significant role in this extraordinary public policy experiment and its aftermath. Our format today will be three one-hour sessions covering the emergence and initial experience of airline deregulation in part one, the post-deregulation era, and the influence of deregulation on the restrictive regime governing international air transportation in part two, and some overall perspectives and retrospectives in part three. At least that's how we plan it in theory, but it's really up to our distinguished interlocutor <laughs> and our distinguished guest as to how this conversation will unfold. Let me do some quick introductions so that we can jump right into substance. Our interviewee, Robert Lloyd Crandall, known throughout the aviation industry as Bob Crandall, is the former president and chairman of American Airlines. An MBA from the Wharton School, he worked for TWA in the 1960s, veered off into the retail industry, and returned in 1973 as senior financial vice president for American. A strong critic of deregulation prior to the passing of the 1978 legislation, Bob nevertheless led American to significant success in the reordered marketplace. He became president of the airline in 1982, and in 1985, he succeeded Albert Casey as the airline's chairman and CEO. Among his significant industry innovations were the first frequent flyer program in the industry and the use of computer reservation systems. Bob's candor and outspokenness are legendary, and he will certainly be asked to comment on some of his long trail of quotable remarks. Here's one that the public, or at least the investing public, may have taken on board, and I quote, I've never invested in, an, in any airline. I'm an airline manager. I don't invest in airlines. And I always said to the employees of American, this is not an appropriate investment. It's a great place to work, and it's a great company that does important work, but airlines are not an investment. And another quote, a lot of people came into the airline business after deregulation, he noted, adding, quote, most of them promptly exited minus their money, unquote. Bob was the 1997 recipient of the prestigious Horatio Alger Award, honoring Americans who have achieved distinction just by challenging life circumstances. And in 2001, he received the Tony Janus Award for outstanding leadership in the commercial aviation industry. And as I mentioned to him earlier today, the 2009 winner is Representative James Oberstar, the chairman of the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Bob retired from American in 1998 and continues to be active in a wide range of business matters, some of them aviation related. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, sir. Your interlocutor today, former U.S. Ambassador J.D. Bindenagel, is someone you encountered, Bob, in those heady days in the early 1990s when the giant transatlantic code-sharing alliances were first starting to emerge. J.D.'s long and distinguished tenure at the U.S. State Department, culminating in his appointment as U.S. Ambassador and Special Envoy for Holocaust issues in 2002, included periods as part of the U.S. government negotiating team in bilateral aviation talks with Germany when the Civil Aeronautics Board made rest in peace hell sway in such matters, and later on open skies issues and the use of code sharing as an alliance bonding device. JD retains a healthy interest in aviation issues, as we realized when we were prepping with him for this interview. But his career with sojourns in Washington, in Europe, and in Asia has ranged broadly over many diplomatic negotiations concerning issues as diverse as the status of forces, agreements, World War II, forced labor and property restitution issues, the worldwide ban on the sale of conflict diamonds, the reunification of Germany, and the deployment of US Pershing missiles in Europe. JD holds an MPA from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and is the recipient of numerous US and foreign awards of merit and distinction, including the State Department's Distinguished Service Award in 2001 and a Presidential Award for Outstanding Contributions to Foreign Policy. We're very proud and honored at DePaul University to have JD serving now as our Vice President for Community Government and International Affairs, where he's responsible for deepening the connections between the Chicago campus and our many overseas campuses and communities. JD is also a founding member of this International Aviation Law Institute 
and we are delighted that he has agreed, without a moment's hesitation, to bridge the years since he last worked with Bob Crandall and to appear today as Bob's interlocutor. Welcome also to you, JD, and I now turn these proceedings over to you. Thank you very much, Brian. And Bob, I too want to thank you for joining us here at the DePaul University's Law School International Aviation Law Institute for this very, very interesting conversation. And I must say, it's a pleasure to speak with a man who changed the way the world flies, according to the Wall Street Journal. And during your 25 years at American Airlines, you were instrumental in introducing several changes which revolutionized the travel industry. Now, Jeff Shane remarked in 2006 that the mid-1970s deregulation was more, little more than a fashionable idea among academics. That's why that's a time when I was a young lieutenant in the 3rd Infantry Division in Germany, and my first encounter with aviation and government policy was with Pan American Airlines, right, flying over East Germany and landing in Berlin, kind of making point that this is a defining moment for government's interest in mobility as a vital po political interest. But tell me, how did you come into the aviation industry? And when you first entered in the 1960s at TWA, did you have any sense that deregulation was about to come? No, <clears throat> no, no. I, when I, I got into the business in the late 1960s, uh, I was working for Hallmark Cards in Kansas City. And uh, TWA offered me a job, which I turned down repeatedly. And finally, my wife said to me, and, uh, you know, I, I hire the girls out back to babysit, but they're often not available because they're in Paris or Rome for dinner. And I don't see why you don't take the job so I can go to dinner in Paris <laughs> or Rome. So I did. And that's how I got into the airline business. Fascinating. Yeah. And was deregulation a, a thought even then? Was there was no thought. There was there was certainly no discussion of deregulation in the late nineteen sixties. In fact, we were talking earlier today. It'd be very interesting to go back and examine the politics that led to deregulation of the industry in nineteen seventy eight. We had Ted Kennedy and Jimmy Carter, right. uh, who were in in their normal political personas. I would not think have been the leaders of an effort which would disadvantage, uh, in a very severe way, uh, labor in all, in, a, in all of its forms, both organized labor and unorganized labor. And the consequence is, for some reason or other, the, the press picked up the notion of lower fares, and the Congress uh, bought into the idea, thinking that somehow or the other it could have lower fares without affecting the structure of the industry which was, of course, romantic nonsense. Uh, you weren't going to have low affairs without having very profound effects on the way the system worked. And that's the point we tried to make. We were, both Casey and I were very much opposed to deregulation. And I remain opposed to it. I think it's very bad public policy. Well, that's a very important point to begin with. Can, can you tell us what, what it was like to be regulated with the Civil Aeronautics Board? What, they were regulating routes and, and capacity and prices and service. How did that work at that time? And, and how did it serve the public interest as well as the private interest? Well, first you've got to define what do you think the public interest is? Right. I mean, a ubiquitous transportation system, ubiquitous, capable, safe transportation system is an absolute requirement for any country that wants to be a leading nation. Got to have good communications. You've got to have good transportation. You've got to have good top-flight education. Uh, the regulated airline system, which was regulated from '38 to '78, had done a very good job of assuring ubiquity. That most places in the United States had access to scheduled transportation, uh, and that transportation was priced in a reasonably common way for all those points. Now, the, I, think, I think the regulatory regime that the CAB had applied, or had applied certainly by the 60s and the 70s, was perhaps unduly regulatory, that is, unduly restrictive. But the fact of the matter is, the notion which Fred Kahn and others had that the airline business would mimic the hotel industry shows a profound ignorance about the nature of the business. If I want to operate a very expensive hotel in Chicago, 
I only need to attract a very small percentage of the people, all of whom are here at the same time, overnight. That's when you want a hotel. Except for a few other times, you might want a hotel in the morning, but you know, mostly at night. So the fact of the matter is, you can take the whole universe of people that are going to be in hotels in Chicago, and that universe is present at a single time. So it can subdivide itself. Some people will stay at the Four Seasons. At the other end, some people will stay at the lowest possible price denominator. People will distribute themselves. The airline business isn't like that. Mm -hmm. All the people who may want to fly to Chicago are unwilling to come at a single time. Some want to come at 8, some want to come at 8.30, some want to come at 9.30, etc. So it's spread throughout the day. The consequence is right, single high-priced, high-quality airlines have never worked because they don't offer a range of departure times. So you've had people that have tried to fly, for example, from the West Coast to the East Coast. They have very, they have little frequency. The only portion of the market they can access is that portion of the market which both wants a high level of service and is willing to wait all day to, in, to uh, take advantage of it. So the consequence is the airline business could never look like the hotel business as we tried to tell people. And as a consequence, that isn't the way the industry is going to develop. So you're not going to have high service airlines, middle service airlines, and low service airlines. It's not going to happen that way. Everybody's going to get distilled down to the lowest common denominator. And that is what has happened. And was there, was there a sense of dissatisfaction with the way it was regulated at the time? Oh, I think, I think there was some dissatisfaction, not, not in the, in the, uh, uh, among the public at large. There was a lot of dissatisfaction within the industry because the regulation was very restrictive. And so a lot of things that you would like to try, you weren't allowed to try. The only, uh, there were two low cost, very low, low cost airlines on the West Coast. And the press picked up the idea, well, if they can fly for X cents a mile on the West Coast, why can't we do it everywhere? And, and of course, immediately, service vanished in a great many communities. And in the five to 10 years immediately following deregulation, more than one member of Congress said, that's the worst vote I ever cast. And if I could go back and redo it again, I would. But the the industry really fought the the uh, at that well, the time. Industry, they... The industry fought it until United, which at that point was the largest airline, mm -hmm. decided that if it could get deregulated, that if deregulation happened, it that is United would be able to dominate the business, and therefore they changed their position. And when they changed their position, the the industry's unanimity went away, and United started to say, well, maybe this could work, and the consequence is the bill passed. Again, I don't, I, I really do not, didn't understand then, I don't understand now the, the political underpinnings of the deal, other than the fact that the media made the notion of low fares very attractive. But at the same time, there were innovations in, in the other aspects of the business that you had. Uh, service was one. and. I was struck by the, uh, the efforts that, uh, that American undertook with its uh, Boeing 747 airliners to have, to have uh, piano bars uh, on it and well, trying to try to do a service as well. No, they weren't doing service. They were just trying to attract people to fill up an airplane that was too big. 747 should never have been bought for domestic service. It was intended to be a very long-range airplane. That airplane weighed 600,000 pounds in its initial version, or thereabouts. You put 600,000 pounds up in the air, it costs a lot. You want it, once you've got it up in the air, you want to keep it up in the air for a long time. <laughs> you want to fly it as far as it will go. It was intended to be a transatlantic airplane. Some of the domestic carriers bought it, tried to fly it between New York and California. And the consequence is there, was way, there were way too many seats. So Americans said, how can, how, can we, how can we get some more people to choose us rather than the other guys? They said, well, what we'll do is we'll put a piano bar upstairs. Terrific. We get Frank Sinatra to come along on the early flights, a couple of the early flights, and people will congregate in the upstairs lounge, have a great time, and it worked. It did. So it was a form of competition right? Right? between in, a, in an industry which has typically had, and typically had in those years, relatively low load factors. 
So too many people were flying big airplanes from East Coast to West Coast, and there was a competition to see who could, who could offer an attraction that was sufficiently unique to attract a predominant share of the business, and that's what American did with its piano bar. Now, <clears throat> did the, uh, the CAB regulate this then? Did they intervene? And why, why, did it, why did it stop if it was a popular uh, item? Well, it, on didn't, the it didn't stop, uh, J.D. I, think, I, I don't recall exactly what happened, but we flew the piano bars for a few years, mm -hmm. huh? and then we, used, we found better uses for the 747s, and we found alternative airplanes to fly transcontinentally. <laughs> That's, which is, what, of course, what should happen in the first place. Right. And we're in, in, the, in the regulation at the time under the CAB, the question of labor. What, what role did labor play in, in, in labor, changing? Labor didn't. There was, there was really, uh, in the years before deregulation, labor has always had a predominant position in, because the, the, the airlines are under the Railway Labor Act, which allows national unions as opposed to local unions. Most of the airlines that existed at that time had been organized right after World War II, and all were heavily unionized. So <clears throat> the, what, what, what happened is that the airlines, one airline would, would have a labor negotiation, a, a new price point would be set a line for pilots, for example. Mm -hmm. right? All the other airlines would match. The unions would demand that the, those airlines move up to the level established by the first one. But the airlines had the ability to blunt the strength of labor because they had what was called the mutual aid pact. So if an airline went on strike, the other airlines, under the terms of the pact, right, turned over to the struck airline the excess revenue, that is the revenue that they got which exceeded their pre-strike share of the market, right. turned it over to the struck airline. Don Nyrop was then running Northwest. He took a strike every three years. And he made money during the strikes because Nyrop was a very cost-conscious manager. And the consequence is if he, he shut the airline down for three or four or five months, the rest of us flew the people where they needed to go. We turned the money over to Nyrop. He made a profit. Right? And it served our purposes because it prevented the very rapid escalation of labor costs. One of the many mistakes that Congress made when they deregulated the business was they outlawed the mutual aid pact. So ever since, the, un the, the unions have dominated the airline industry and have imposed very high costs immediately before uh, United's first bankruptcy. Uh, the pilots said they, they extracted a 25% pay increase from United. Immediately after that negotiation, the head of the United Pilots Union said, we don't want to kill the Golden Goose, but we do want to wring every last drop out of it. And that's what the labor unions have tended to do. And the, the airlines effectively have no defense against that. You cannot tolerate a pilot strike. Pilots require extensive training. You can take the greatest ace out of the US Air Force. He can't step into a commercial cockpit without many weeks of training. So the consequence, you can't go out and replace 10,000 pilots. There are plenty of pilots out there but it would take years to hire 10,000 new pilots and train those pilots. And the consequence is an airline confronted with a, a prospective strike starts to lose business before the strike, loses all of its business during the strike, and takes many, many months after the strike to recover its, the volume of business. So when you sit down and do the numbers, there isn't any demand by labor that is high enough to justify a strike. The consequence is airline labor has long been compensated way above its market value. That is, if you take the components of a flight attendant's job or a uh, fleet service clerk's job, a baggage handler's job, a pilot's job, all of these, take all the component skills and requirements and compare them to what people make in other businesses with those same kind of skill set requirements, Airline labor has typically been 25 to 40 percent above the market rate. And that is because of the susceptibility of airlines right, to strikes. They simply cannot tolerate them. Looking again at the, the, another element of, the, of uh, regulation were the routes and establishing routes. How did that play in, 
in uh, the question of deregulation or regulation? Well, the CAB, the CAB's mission was, among other things, to be certain that, that all cities had uh, appropriate levels of service. So let's suppose an airline wanted to go in and fly from New York to Dallas. The CAB might look at it and say, that's, that's fine, but there's already adequate service between New York and Dallas, but there's no service between New York and Nashville, and very little service between Nashville and Dallas. So we'll let you fly from New York to Dallas, but you have to stop in Nashville. Yeah. And, the, and, and by doing that, they built up a root structure. It was a regulated root structure. It isn't a root structure where the capacity went to where most of the people wanted to fly. It went into a network uh, which was designed to provide the highest level of ubiquitous transportation, that is, to allow people from cities and towns all across the United States to get to other places. Now, and, and in fact, go, take, go back to what I said to you a few minutes ago about high levels of service. There were nonstop services, for example, that existed during the regulatory environment that went away the day deregulation happened. So if you have a city, let's say, in the middle south that had one flight a day nonstop to LA, that flight immediately vanished. Right. Because after deregulation, that city would have four flights a day to Chicago, four flights a day to St. Louis, four flights a day to, to Atlanta, four flights a day to Dallas, all the hubs. And all of the people who had previously flown on the nonstop would distribute themselves on the one stops because they went at different times of the day. So immediately, an airplane that used to carry 90 people a day nonstop right, from that city to California would only have 25 people. And of course, the operator immediately canceled it. So there are lots of places in the United States right, that lost service they very much wanted to keep, and that led to the congressional, uh, to the, to the uh, congressional comments about this being a, a dreadful vote, and they wish they hadn't done it. <laughs> There's another aspect uh, that where I came in was in uh, the CAB's bilateral negotiations, in my case, with Germany. How did the international regulatory framework play into the debate about deregulation? Well, I don't think it did. It didn't play into the debate about deregulation. The discussions between Germany and the United States, for example, which ultimately led to an alliance between Lufthansa and United occurred in the early 1990s. That was long after deregulation. So it leading up to the 1977 decision by United, that's the key, the breakaway, as you, as that you was indicated. Well, that was certainly the breakaway within the industry. Right? And it, it came about because uh, United's leadership at the time I think it was, it was either Dick Ferris or Eddie Carlson. I think it was Dick Ferris. Uh, United was the biggest airline, and they thought they would be able to successfully dominate the industry after deregulation. Mm -hmm. I'm pleased to say we proved them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you were very innovative. We'll come to that at, at, some, at some later point. So the deregulation itself, the, the bill that came out of um, the Congress didn't automatic, didn't in one fell swoop take away the CAB. Pretty much it did. A, it did. It did. How, did, how did the you, you how see, did if, if you go back, if you go back and look at the history, well, the first thing the CAB did is they said, okay, everybody that wants to apply for new routes, all right, form a line outside the office, all right. We're going to start taking applications for new routes at eight mm -hmm. o'clock on Monday morning. Instantly, there was a long line went around the block. Right? There was a big fight that broke out because there was a woman in the line who needed to go to the restroom. Right? And they asked that her, that the, the next guy hold her place. And the guy said, I'm not holding your place. Because right? I want those roots too. You're not getting them. <laughs> so there was a, the CAB had to make a decision. The first decision it made was whether the woman was entitled to her place in line. She was. She was? Yes, she was. <laughs> yeah. Harding Lawrence right, destroyed Braniff overnight. Harding didn't believe that deregulation would happen. So on a single day, Braniff entered, I think the right number, you can check this, is 54 new routes. Mm. They, took, they, had, they had a hub in Dallas. Right. They took the hub and they took it apart, took all the airplanes, and flew into as many new cities as they could, as they could reach with that fleet. 
So they went into some cities, Buffalo, New York, for example, I believe. Again, you can mm -hmm. historically you can check the facts. They flew an airplane in there at three o'clock in the morning, turned around, and flew it out again, so that when deregulation went away, as they were confident it would, they would have the right to fly to Buffalo. Because it was very hard in in the regulated world to get permission to serve a city you didn't already serve. So Braniff spread out and went to all these new cities. Conversely, when deregulation happened, we took a look at the American route system. We said, we, what we need is we need, we need to build bigger hubs than we have. So we moved to Dallas. Two or three years later, Braniff decided they'd made a mistake. And they tried to come back to Dallas. And of course, we made it as difficult for them as we could. And they, they went into bankruptcy and failed. And we were widely blamed for that, wrongly. They said, you know, we played tricks with the reservation system, so if we didn't. The fact is that Braniff had given away the hub. There was, a, there was an article at, which I think appeared in 1974 or 1975. Again, you, something that can be checked in Fortune magazine. It had Russ Thayer on the cover about this funny little airline in Dallas that was doing this funny thing called a hub where they flew all these purple and pink and red and orange airplanes. They all came in at the same time from different places and then they left and went in the opposite direction. And while they were all on the ground, people got off the air, incoming airplanes and distributed themselves across the outgoing airplanes. And this was a hub. Now, of course, Delta had, was doing much the same thing in Atlanta at the time, a, a hub, but on a much smaller, smaller scale. But Braniff attracted attention because Mary Lawrence was involved and Harding Lawrence was involved and they had these push co colored airplanes. But there was, there was quite an article about what a successful thing this was. So if, if in fact Harding Lawrence had expanded the hub instead of taking the hub apart and flying to 54 new places, right. Braniff would exist and American would not. And so the, the hub, uh, was the hub uh, process out of uh, deregulation, or did it? No, the, the hub process existed before deregulation, right. but, it, but you never had the power to really develop the hub because you couldn't get the rights to fly to all the cities. So now, now you can fly airplanes any way you want to fly them. So now if you've got 50 cities to the east of a hub and 50 cities to the west of a hub, right you can create 50 times 50, 2,500 markets, right? Just by flying 50 airplanes in and 50 airplanes out, you are simultaneously serving in a single slice of the day 2,500 individual markets from each point on this side to each point on that side. That's how hubs work. Right. They are the best, most efficient way to connect small places to other small places, and small places to big places, and small places to the world. Right. So for all the bad press that hubs have gotten, and all the nonsense about point-to-point nonstop services, <coughs> in the absence of hubs, you'd have very little service beyond the biggest 150 cities in America. You mentioned the press. Talk to us about the media. What, what role did the media play in and not only the Kennedy-Carter discussion and leading up to the presidential event, but the deregulation itself. And as you say, they were writing J about the hubs. J.D., I don't, I don't know. I, I really don't recall that period of time very clearly. Mm -hmm. I, I think you can go back and read Petzinger's book. And there are various books that have been written that are, that are reasonably accurate right. in terms of what happened at that time. But it was clear that there was a lot of excitement about low fares. The problem is that, that if you establish a public policy whose only goal is low fares, right. then you're not going to satisfy any of the other public policy objectives that you might have, whatever they are. Well, then your brilliance takes over. I must say, I was uh, very impressed with to see the innovations that you took personally to defend the industry, to expand the industry, to move uh, through the saber system with the reservation system. Uh, that revolutionized the industry. The uh, super saver fares that you were also willing to compete with and, and deep discounts and the first yield management well, system. They did, look, we did all of those things, J.D., because now we could. Right. 
Right? So the fact that you couldn't do those things when the industry was regulated. And those, those all those things, they, I mean, they, they made it, those innovations made it possible for American to compete more successfully in a deregulated world than our competitors. And in that sense, and, and that was good, and America went from round numbers, 35,000 employees to 110,000 employees. We went from 250 airplanes to 800 airplanes. And if the government had stayed out of the way, right, we would have been the dominant international carriers, carrier, but the government decided not to. What, what did they do? They allowed foreign carriers to come in and code share with wow. U.S. carriers, thereby depriving the United States of its primary mm -hmm. aviation benefit. The United States is a bigger domestic market. We have bigger hubs. Right. If I have a bigger hub than you, I will destroy you. Right. Because I will create more frequency than you can support. So from my big hub, I'm going to operate two or three times as many airplanes as you can operate from your smaller hub, and I will win the competition. Did the, did the international carriers come in and with these uh, innovations as well? They, they, they followed, followed, they followed, followed along. Your, your, sure, everybody always, everybody always catches up. Yeah, exactly. Nobody stays ahead. I mean, you, we invented a lot of things because, because I had a background in IT and because I had gone out and hired a lot of IT people and a lot of OR people. And so we did a lot of things. We simply knew a lot of things about the business that our competitors did not know. That's how you did yield management. Right. Simply Tell knew about more that. about the value of each seat. So that, for example, yield management is nothing more than establishing the probable value of every seat on every airplane right, for the next 365 days. So the, a, a, an airplane from Austin to Dallas that, that operates, that's going to operate tomorrow and has three empty seats. We won't sell you those seats to go to Dallas at any price because we know that in Austin there are three people who will want to fly to Dallas and then fly to Europe. And if we can't get them from Austin to Dallas, the, 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 the seat that we would otherwise sell to Frankfurt or London or Paris will go unoccupied. So the the value to the system of the last seat from Austin, when we know it's going to be sold to somebody that wants to go international, is many times the value right, of that seat right, being occupied by somebody that simply wants to come to Dallas. In its simplest form, that's yield management. But that, that is a, an issue of price again. And it's, not a, it's not an issue not of price, it's an issue of value. Right. The notion that every seat should have the same price right, says that every seat presumptively has the same value, which simply says you do not understand how the seat's going to be used. As soon as we were able to gather data about how the seat's going to be used, we were able to establish differential values. You know, in the old days, mm -hmm. you could walk around London, right, now this is in the 60s and the 70s, and you'd see blackboards propped up against the side of building. Seats available to the United States, 50 pounds. Today, this afternoon. So if you had bought a ticket before you came to, to London, round trip ticket, which was refundable, you simply put the ticket in your pocket, you went out to the airport, you bought a ticket to the United States for 50 pounds, and when you got home, you refunded the return value right, of the, the round trip ticket you'd already bought. The notion was that you should sell the cheapest seat just before departure, just before it's going to spoil. That's exactly backwards. Just before it's going to spoil is the time when the seat has the highest value. Because at that point, you have an alternative. Buy the seat or swim. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Whereas, if I've got a 100-seat airplane, and I can predict three months ahead of time, that I'm only going to have demand for 50 seats at the, at the rack rate, then I'm going to sell the other 50 seats cheap 90 days ahead of time. 
Now I've only got a 50-seat airplane to sell at the rack rate. And that fits perfectly. So now I've got 100 seats, 50 occupied by people who wouldn't otherwise have flown because I sold them the seat at a charter price three months ago. And the other 50 willing to pay the rack rate because they have, there's a high, much higher time value component to their requirement for transportation. That's the way the business works. So explain the difference then between value, as you've been talking about, and this, this delightful quote that we have from you that says, no airline can ever afford to charge a different price than another airline. That's, so that's, value abso that's, a, that's absolutely true because uh, for that last seat from Austin, I don't care what the other guy's charging. Because the last seat from Austin, the guy who's coming from Austin to go to Paris is going to fly with me because the other guy doesn't fly to Paris. But for the rest of the seats, most of the people who are going to go from Austin to Dallas are going to buy the ticket from whoever buys, offers the seat cheapest. Right. So we did all kinds of experiments on the West Coast in short haul transportation. If you change your price by a dollar, mm -hmm. you lose almost all the business. Not some of it, all of it. So if there's a, if there's a fare out there for $99, I'm, I'm flying every day from L.A. to San Francisco for $99. The other guy's charging 100 bucks. Over a period of three months, I'll get all the business. You're not going to pay the 100 bucks. Well, what's the other dollar for? Right. Now, the airline business is also unique in the sense that you can go out this afternoon. Let's suppose you and I decide we're going to go out and buy some product. doesn't make any difference. Let's suppose we want to buy a Chevrolet. Right? Which would be good for General Motors. <laughs> yeah, they need but it. The, but the, the, the reality is that I don't know what a Chevrolet costs at every dealership in the metropolitan Chicago area, but I know what every seat on every airline leaving O'Hare for the next 365 days is worth. All I got to do is turn on my computer. You have perfect transparency price-wise. So if United changes its price between Chicago and New York at 10 o'clock this morning, American will change it at 10.01. Because its computers will immediately say, attention, United has changed its price from Chicago to New York, and the computers will automatically change American's price. Does this ever lead to the Justice Department worrying about how those prices are fixed, and as opposed to a transparent system where the market clears that, uh, oh, the Justice Department has occupied itself for years and years with this issue. Mm -hmm. and so what the airline, be, but no airline, because no airline can afford to be at a disadvantage, what, you'll, what, what happens is that airlines change their prices on Sunday mornings. And they leave the price change up for about three hours. If their competitors don't match, they withdraw it. That's fine. Nothing illegal about that. So what does the Justice Department do? Justice doing? Department says there's nothing about it because the fact is it's not illegal. It's not illegal to watch your competitor's price. You can't talk to your competitor. Right. You right. can't send him a note and say, pay attention this Sunday morning. Right? But, <laughs> but you can change your price. And while your prices change, people can buy tickets. But if the other guy doesn't match, you can be sure it's not going to stay there. That's right. So what you've got is a tyranny of labor, which drives costs right. up. You've got an absolutely unregulated market so that in any market where an airline is making money, mm -hmm. other airlines will promptly move capacity into that market. So pretty soon nobody makes money anymore. So if, if, for example, Americans making money flying to, from New York to Puerto Rico, two or three other guys will promptly add service to Puerto Rico. And because when they add service from New York to Puerto Rico, there's no market awareness, they'll cut prices. So now American, of course, has to cut prices right. as well. Right? And all of a sudden, nobody's, there's way too much capacity, nobody's making any money. The guy with the deepest pockets hangs on for a while. The rest of the people go away. Right? Maybe prices inch back up to the point where somebody's making a little money. But this is why the U.S. airline business constantly loses money. 
Was and it? has lost, since Orville and Wilbur first flew, <laughs> more than $35 billion. And has never returned its cost of capital. So how, how does, uh, did, under the CAB, were they making money? Yeah, they were, oh, I, they, they made a little money. Mm -hmm. because the amount of capacity was regulated and the prices they could charge was regulated. They never made much money. Right. Because labor, labor sort of took it as quickly as it was made, but they, they made sufficient money. So they were able to sustain a constantly growing airline system, right, which operated with a very high level of safety and provided reasonably equivalent access in terms of both convenience and price to most cities in America. Now, I would argue with you that I would, the airline system is a utility. You have to have a competent airline system if you want to be a first world country. You have to have good transportation. You have to have good communication. You have to have good medical facilities. You have to have good education. These are essential components of a first, of a first world country. Right. The United States is falling steadily and steadily, further and further behind in every one of those areas. Transportation as a, as a whole is, is critical. Let me go back to your question, your original question that, that you were posing. What, what was the motivation between Kennedy and, and Carter? I don't know. Obviously, they were running for president. That was clear. One against the other. One against the other. Deregulation wasn't really in the air, as we talked about, and yet, the airline industry was put out front on the deregulation debate that then became a debate. Uh, well, but again, you see, we, we really don't know. Once again, I, I, I don't know. We speculated earlier. Chappaquiddick was in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. Kennedy was trying to take the nomination from Carter. The media made low fares a big deal, and Kennedy was the champion of low fares. Maybe Carter felt that he couldn't, he couldn't cede the ground to Kennedy. Right. Who knows? I, I mean, I really do not understand the underlying politics. Huh? But you saw, the, you saw the way the market reacted, and, and there was a movement uh, for the uh, 1978 Act. And it did pass in Congress, and then, and then yeah. the debate began as well, what... Well, there was a big debate beforehand as well. Mm -hmm. And then there was a ba debate afterwards, and the CAB, you know, pretty quickly went away. And the business became completely deregulated. The line formed, people signed up, they flew to new places, the CAB didn't turn anything down for a long time before it went out of business, right? And then it went out of business in a formal sense two, three years later. That, that, that process was uh, very interesting. Uh, were you there and what did you do with uh, Alfred Kahn as he was going through his, his implementation of this process? Uh, I uh, sat and talked to Fred Kahn on numerous occasions and told him I thought it was a grievous error of public policy. He disagreed. Clearly. <laughs> and, and the legislation uh, then led to a larger uh, shift in, in, the, uh, in the issue of, of deregulation throughout the country. And the well, airline that's right. And we're still, you know, we're, we're now in the midst of what some would call a recession and others, others would call a depression, which is the consequence of the deregulation of the financial business. In virtually every state where it's been tried, deregulation of the power business is, is regarded as a failure. The whole notion right, that everything can run, that the invisible hand of the market is always going to produce a, a result that optimizes society's returns is simply not correct. And that doesn't make me a communist, but it does say that I think there's a real role for government right. in a capitalist system where you've got to control the excesses. It makes no sense to have conga lines at LaGuardia Airport every night <coughs> spewing kerosene out, out, out the back of jet engines, putting people on the tarmac for two or three hours at a time <coughs> for no reason other than the fact that the FAA and the DOT refuse to limit the number of airplanes that can operate at LaGuardia to the number that can be handled. There is a role for regulation, maybe a more modest role than it, than it was between 1938 and 1978. But nonetheless, right, there is some public policy objective other than lo the lowest possible price. 
there, we're, we were talking about capacity and, and service and, and routes as all elements. If you were to critique the CAB today from this point of view, if you would look at what they did well and what they didn't do well, what would you, where would you find I think, them? I think they did a pretty good job of establishing reasonable price points. I think they were overly restrictive in terms of the amount of capacity that they allowed into the system. <coughs> but on the whole, if you look at the record of the U.S. airline business between 1938 and 1978, you'll, you'll come away thinking they must have done a pretty decent job. And, and so domestically we've covered, and you, you mentioned quickly that the international, the role of international carriers didn't play a lot didn't, into didn't, the... Didn't really play into the, the debate about uh, deregulation in 1978. Yeah. Thereafter, uh, after dereg deregulation took hold domestically, then you began to hear a lot of conversation about the restrictive nature of international aviation, which, as I'm sure both of you know and most of the people watching will know, is kind of rooted in some in treaties that were struck in 1942 and 1943, uh, during which, incidentally, the United States argued strongly in favor of open skies. All right. Uh, and which the, Europe, the, the rest of the countries of the world didn't want, didn't want anything to do with that, believing, I think quite properly, that at that point the United States had all the people, all the money, and all the airplanes, and would have dominated international aviation, which would have been a good outcome. But anyway, it didn't come to that. So the fact is we, we had very restrictive route rights in international aviation. And in the early 1990s, as the U.S. airlines uh, grew stronger, the, European, the, the Europeans now suddenly became much more interested in open skies. And they got interested in open skies very simply because they wanted access to the U.S. market, which the U.S. government gave them, all in the name of more competition and lower prices. The actual result has been the emasculation of the U.S. the U.S. international aviation business. There is less U.S. iron and more international iron flying in international routes today than, than there was 10 years ago, and there will be less still. Because the fact of the matter is that Europe and most of Asia <coughs> has lots of ways to control the frequency of operations. In Frankfurt, for example, it is simply not possible to get a daytime slot. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to be a U.S. airline that wants to launch a new flight to Frankfurt, and you don't happen to be either United or, or Lufthansa, both of whom can, find, can swap slots with one another and they find ways to accommodate it, but if you happen to be some other airline, the only slot that's available is 4 o'clock in the morning, which is not a really popular you know, <laughs> arrival time. So the fact of the matter is that international markets, we, we have given international carriers lots more access to the U.S. market. The U.S. carriers have not enjoyed similar opportunities to grow abroad. And the consequence is the U.S. industry, uh, which, which has not enjoyed success at home and it has not enjoyed much success internationally, except in those regions where local carriers are not fully able to compete as in Latin America. American continues to enjoy good success. So <coughs> if you, you mentioned that uh, the structure of the airline industry is really built from 38 to 42, mm -hmm. and, then, and then the Chicago Convention, of course, in 44. Can you comment on what your views were from the, uh, the convention, the Chicago Convention, and, and whether or not we should be thinking about something like that for today? Well, the Chicago, the, what, what we should what we should be thinking about today is applying appropriate rules of parity. Let, let, let's assume, let's first assume that we establish what are the public policy goals of the U.S. government. If the only goal is the lowest possible price, then existing public policy is fine. If we have some interest in sustaining a vigorous U.S. aviation business, and if we have some interest in U.S. jobs, then we could do a number of things. The first thing you could do is you could say you, you may not maintain any U.S. aircraft offshore, mm -hmm. which would immediately bring several hundred thousand good jobs back to the United States. You could, uh, you could look at, right, 
airport congestion, and you could say it at any airport, where, it, where the delay between the time off the gate and the time off the airport is more than half an hour, we're going to force capacity reductions because we're not going to allow people to burn kerosene they don't need to burn. In international markets, right, in, in any, inter any international airport where a U.S. carrier cannot get an, an operating slot as easily as he can, as a foreign airline can get it at JFK, right, then international relations between those two countries are to cease until that's corrected. The fact of the matter is, look, low prices and extreme competition serve one kind of public interest. Good jobs and a vigorous airline industry serve other public interests. The United States has never articulated what its transportation policy goals are and needs to do so. Once we know what the, what the policy goals are, we can sit down and write prescriptions. But without some kind of articulated set of policy objectives, who, kn who knows what you should do? Well, I I'm, I'm very intrigued with that, and I'm, we'll have more time to, to continue that conversation, particularly when you think about, you said transportation policy, not aviation policy, oh, which is very policy. important right. to, to connect rail and all highways and, and all of those issues that we're now debating in the United States. Well, sure. look at, and look at what, if you, if you go to virtually any European air, airport, right, there is high-speed transportation available between the airport and the city center. All over Europe, there's a network of trains. And all over Europe, right, gasoline is much more expensive than, than it is in the United States. Those reflect different public policy objectives. Right? And until we redefine our public policy objectives, we're going to have the same hour and a half congestion between O'Hare and Chicago that we suffered through this morning. Well, Thank you very much, Bob. We're going to take a quick break for a few minutes, and uh, we'll be back to continue this fascinating conversation. Thank you. Okay.